uh hi um uh, hi friends so today i'll be uh, talk uh, taking the topic of salivary glands uh so um as we all know there are three major salivary glands and about some 800 of minor salivary glands so um the three major salivary glands are the paired glands which are the uh, two parotids the two uh, submandibular glands and the two sublingual salivary glands so we'll talk about one by one and um prior to the core topic uh, you should know that salivary gland as such is a short case so you need not be writing um a big history of, for anything uh, for any of these salivary gland swellings plus the salivary glands um uh, examination is very little there is not much for Uh, uh to do exam examination like in varicose veins or in hernia so with this short introduction about salivary gland we'll start the uh, topic uh so so coming to the parotid gland parotid gland uh, as you, as we know is the uh, ma- uh, one of the major salivary gland and it is the bigger salivary gland and it uh, it is pyramidal in shape which occupies uh the uh, space in front below and behind the ear lobule so um uh, history wise what will be the patient's complaint uh, if a patient is coming with a parotid gland swelling it will be either a, a swelling which the patient had noted a mass which the patient had noted so what 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 is the typical what are the typical features of a parotid gland swelling so a parotid gland swelling if you actually see it as i told before the it it is occupying in front below and behind the ear lobule so uh, uh, naturally when the parotid gland is enlarging it will cause lifting up of the ear lobule that is one thing the second thing is uh, obliteration of the retromandibular groove uh, there is behind the mandible there is a groove which is naturally present but if this parotid gland is getting enlarged that groove will be obliterated so lifting up of ear lobule and obliteration of the retromandibular groove are classical signs of a parotid gland enlargement uh now uh so um what what other complaints can a patient uh, present with it can be a pain due to uh, uh conditions like a parotid abscess or any other inflammatory conditions of the salivary gland or a stone obstructing the stenson duct so um uh, coming to the anatomy so parotid gland has a, a superficial lobe and a deep lobe a superficial lobe and the deep lobe is separated by a plane called the fascio venous plane of patty this fascio venous plane as the name suggest has a um Uh, contains the facial nerve and the retromandibular vein so this facial nerve and the retromandibular vein forms the fascio venous plane of patty uh, so it divides the parotid gland into a superficial part and a deep part and um this facial nerve you you all know it branch um, uh, ends as the terminal five branches from inside the parotid um so the clinical importance uh, is while uh, uh, for the examination of the facial nerve uh, so you i i hope you are all aware about the examination of the facial nerve and um, this is in short regarding the uh, anatomy of the um, parotid so i would like to tell you about the clinical examination part of the parotid how to examine the parotid so examination of par- parotid gland is by inspection as i already told there will be lifting up of the ear lobule there will be obliteration of the retromandibular groove uh, and coming uh, to the uh, this is for the enlargement of the superficial lobe now what happens when the deep lobe is getting enlarged will the parotid come out will the parotid get enlarged out outwards no where uh, in a deep lobe enlargement uh, as you all know the deep lobe is deeper to the superficial lobe so it will be enlarging inside so so how will you uh, identify that it is by oral cavity examination oral cavity examination will show uh, deviation of the tonsillar pillar medially so if the 
right side parotid gland is a deep lobe is getting enlarged it will push the right uh, right side tonsillar pillar medially so the normal arch of the um, uh, tonsillar pillar will be lost so there will be an asymmetry which will be seen that is how you uh, see for the um, deep lobe enlargement now um, i told about this tensense duct this tensense duct is a uh, uh, is the duct which is draining the parotid gland and it is of uh, 5 centimeters and it opens opposite the upper second molar tooth now um, uh, in inflammatory conditions in case of parotid abscess in other inflammatory conditions it is also important to visualize the opening of the stensons duct so to visualize the opening of the stensons duct you need to use a spatula and you need to retract the buccal mucosa to see the opening so uh, in such conditions in conditions like uh, parotid abscess you can see pus at the tip of the opening uh, which uh, all which g helps you in diagnosing the uh, inflammatory condition so that is uh, regarding the uh, inspection uh, part of it now coming to palpation uh, as you all know it will be uh, firm uh, normally firm to hard in consistency and um, this palpation of the stensens duct particularly uh, will be done using by digital examination with one finger inside the mouth and one finger outside the uh, in the cheek so uh, you can uh, palpate the stensens duct for abnormalities uh, you, uh, it actually crosses the anterior border of masseter where you can actually feel it uh, from the outside also now uh, coming to the um, anatomy of the submandibular gland uh, the submandibular gland uh, lies in the submandibular uh, triangle uh, which is also the digastric triangle which is bounded by the anterior belly and the posterior belly of digastric so um, uh, like the parotid gland the submandibular gland has a superficial lobe and a deep lobe this, this submandibular gland is actually like a hockey stick uh, so the majority portion will be the superficial lobe and a small deep lobe portion which will be separated by the mylohyoid muscle the mylohyoid muscle separates the superficial and the uh, deep lobe now uh, what is the most common pathology in each of the glands if you uh, if you see that parotid gland the most common pathology will be tumors and uh, uh, one specific uh, thing about parotid gland tumors will be 50 uh, more than 80 percentage of parotid gland tumors will be benign only 20 percentage will be malignant if you uh, take the most common pathology of the submandibular salivary gland uh, it is stones but if you take tumors 50 percentage of the tumors in submandibular gland will be benign and 50 percentage will be malignant and if you take uh, tumors of the minor salivary gland and, and the sublingual salivary gland it is 90 percentage of the tumors will be malignant only 10 percentage will be benign so uh, as the size of the uh, salivary gland is decreasing the tumor potential is increasing uh, okay so uh, the submandibular salivary gland as i told the um, most common pathology is stones uh, and what what is the reason for uh, stone formation in the submandibular gland what is the duct of the submandibular gland it is the wartens duct the wartens duct is again 5 cm in length and it uh, opens on the either side of frenulum uh, so if you see the submandibular uh, gland uh, the the secretion the saliva secretion is very um, mucus whereas in case of parotid it is serous it is much more serous than uh, submandibular gland secretion so sir, being a more mucoid secretion and the anti-gravity flow against the gravity flow of the wartens duct uh, it makes the submandibular gland more prone for the pathology of stones so that is the reason why stones are more common in the submandibular salivary gland now um, again uh, coming to a little more anatomy uh, the, fa the facial artery uh, courses through the submandibular uh, gland so uh, that is uh, one uh, area which you have to be careful 
and the hypoglossal nerve and the lingual nerve these are two uh, nerves which are in close uh, relation with the wartens duct so while uh, the submandibular sided nectomy you should be careful regarding these nerves now coming to the uh, sublingual salivary gland uh, again it will be uh, situated in the floor of the mouth and the most common pathology will be the retention cyst you can you know about the mucosal you know regarding the ranula so uh, extravasation cyst ranula so these are the uh, most common pathology of the uh, sublingual salivary gland um so coming to uh, some um, uh, the, these are the examination points and uh, i would like to add on some of the exam questions so th this is all about the short being a short case this is all what you have to examine it's 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 a sh short history plus a short examination and you will come to the diagnosis so um, a parotid gland swelling uh, uh, what will be the typical feature i have already told you so a parotid gland swelling with these typical feature which i have told you is a pleomorphic adenoma unless otherwise proved a parotid gland swelling is a pleomorphic adenoma because that is the most common tumor of the parotid gland um so um and what what are the other differential diagnosis for a parotid gland swelling it is either between a pleomorphic adenoma versus a wartens tumor now what is the difference between a pleomorphic adenoma and a wartens tumor a pleomorphic adenoma uh, is uh, a ectodermal plus an endodermal uh, origin that is why it is called pleomorphic because of the various morphology mm, whereas wartens tumor is uh, is having only a single uh, embryological uh, content uh, and this uh, pleomorphic adenoma has pseudopod like extension Uh, which makes uh, it more higher chance of recurrence if not uh, given uh, adequate clearance. Whereas in case of a uh, uh, Wharton's tumor, you can I, you can even enucleate the tumor and uh, that 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 is it. It will uh, there is lesser chance of lesser chance. No, there is no absolutely no chance of recurrence unless th there is a multi centric or multi focal disease. So. Um, so the uh, uh, pleomorphic adenoma um, the investigation will be a ultrasound ultrasound scan you can confirm the uh, site from where the tumor is uh, originating and uh, fnac uh, will be done and the treatment option will be a superficial parotidectomy so in a superficial parotidectomy we take the uh, entire superficial lobe so the the now now comes the main questions which you will have to face during your exams if you are getting a parotid gland as a question now uh, how to do a superficial parotidectomy we find the trunk of the facial nerve and we dissect above the facial nerve so once you finish dissection above the uh, all five branches of facial nerve the entire superficial parotid gland will be out so this is how you do a superficial parotidectomy so now uh, comes the question how do you identify the trunk of the facial nerve after putting the incision what is the incision the lacy s incision or the modified blair's incision so after putting the incision what is the next step to find out the facial nerve trunk now the the favorite question for examiners is how do you identify the facial nerve trunk what are the methods of identify, identifying the facial nerve trunk one is the condy's pointer what is the conley's pointer the conley's pointer is um, you know the ou outer one third of the external lordry meatus is cartilage and the inner two third is bony part so the junction of the cartilaginous and the bony part um, has a projection which is called the conley's pointer so from this particular projection 1 cm deep and medial 1 cm medial and deep will be the facial nerve trunk that is one point for identification second point will be superior to the insertion of posterior belly of digastric you know the there is anterior belly of digastric there is posterior belly of di digastric so the posterior belly of digastric will be getting inserted so just above the insertion of the posterior belly is the superior to the insertion of the 
tendon of the posterior belly of digastric you you will find the uh, facial nerve trunk the third identifying uh, uh, structure is the stylomastoid foramen it is through the stylomastoid foramen the facial nerve comes out so identifying the stylomastoid foramen you can identify the facial nerve trunk then fourth it's obviously via the facial nerve monitors with the nerve monitors so these are the anti grade um, methods by which you um, find out the facial nerve trunk now there is a retrograde approach by identifying the branch and coming uh, proximally which branch do you identify the buccal branch the buccal branch you identify and you dissect it retrograde to find out the trunk of the facial nerve so these are the points for identification of the facial nerve that is the first main question the second question is what are the features of malignant transformation of a parotid swelling so normally parotid as i told you parotid swelling uh, is a, a almost always will be pleomorphic adenoma is a benign uh, tumor so uh, there can be malignant tumors also mucoepidermoid carcinoma the most common malignant tumor of the uh, uh, parotid gland so in in a malignant transformation of a parotid swelling what what all features will you will you see one will be the facial nerve palsy second will be rapid enlargement of the parotid gland third there will be ulceration or satellite nodules fourth there will be a uh, cervical lymph node involvement five there will be pain associated so these are the features of malignant transformation of a parotid swelling now um you have done a superficial parotidectomy now what are the uh, complications i uh, i want to emphasize on fray syndrome you all know uh, th there will not be any uh, exam you will be uh, finishing before your final year without answering fray syndrome because it is very important so what what is fray syndrome uh, fray syndrome or gustatory sweating it is a late complication of superficial parotidectomy so what what is happening uh, there is this inferior salivary nucleus from this inferior salivary nucleus there is the uh, preganglionic fiber preganglionic fiber is the glossopharyngeal is carried by the glossopharyngeal nerve so this preganglionic fiber will come to the aortic ganglion and from the aortic ganglion there is this postganglionic fiber this postganglionic fiber is carried by the auriculotemporal nerve so which is this system this is the parasympathetic supply which i am telling what what does the parasympathetic supply do to the uh, parotid for salivation so um, this parasympathetic supply is uh, the the final branches of the auriculotemporal nerve is distributed uh, entirely on the parotid gland which helps in uh, secretion of saliva this is one part this is the parasympathetic fibers now um, there is the sympathetic supply coming from a, a sympathetic ganglion and what does the sympathetic supply do it comes and supplies the skin over the parotid now uh, you you all know that sympathetic uh, activity will be there if there is uh, adrenaline rush if there is a fight fright there will be sympathetic over activity what happens your uh, there will be increased vasodilatation happens there will be flushing um, which will be happening so that is the sympathetic supply so keep in mind regarding the sympathetic and parasympathetic now what happens during the superficial parotidectomy during the superficial parotidectomy you are taking out the su superficial part of the parotid gland now, so what happens to the parasympathetic fibers that is the auriculotemporal nerve endings what happened to the nerve endings the nerve endings will be exposed outside when when you are cutting the parotid uh, above the facial nerve the auriculotemporal nerve will be, the nerve endings will be exposed Uh, will be bare endings now after finishing the uh, pa uh, superficial parotidectomy you are closing the skin now what happens to this nerve endings this nerve endings will be inadvertently supplying the sympathetic fibers which is already supplying the skin now this particular patient now uh, it it takes uh, as i told it is a late complication it takes some time for the innovation to happen so once the innovation has happened the patient is going for a party the patient is seeing some food there will be gustatory sweating why what happens normally when you see food the parasympathetic fibers get activated and uh, you get some excess saliva but instead of producing this saliva inside this parasympathetic fibers 
are inadvertently supplying the sympathetic fiber so there will be gustatory salivation from the uh, skin over the parotid region that is what is happening in free syndrome so um, that is uh, about the um, uh, parotid gland uh, then regarding the submandibular gland as i told the um, most common pathology is the stones um, so um, again uh, the the common uh, question the the main question which the examiner would like to ask you is how do you differentiate what what will be the differential diagnosis for a submandibular gland swe swelling it is the um, submandibular lymph node so how do you differentiate between uh, how do you clinically differentiate between a submandibular lymph node versus a submandibular gland enlargement now if you see as i told before the submandibular gland is like a hook it's like a hockey stick it um, wine it, it it has a deeper portion which hooks on the mylohyoid muscle so if there is a stone obstructing the wartens duct there will be inflammation of the submandibular salivary gland and it uh, get enlarges has a hole so the deeper portion and the superficial portion both portion will get enlarged so when you palpate the submandibular gland from the outside it is palpable now when you palpate it from the inside from with from within the oral cavity because of the deep lobe enlargement then also the deep lobe will be palpable so it is by manually palpable both from the outside as well as from the inside it is by manually palpable now what uh, is it the same uh, case with the uh, submandibular lymph node no the submandibular lymph node is situated below the mylohyoid muscle so it will be only palpable outside that is how you differentiate between a submandibular gland enlargement versus a submandibular lymph node enlargement now um, the most common pathology for submandibular gland is the stone and so stones can cause uh, increase in size of the uh, submandibular gland now how do you identify the stone the, there are uh, calcium stones which will be picked up in x-ray ust can be done which uh, show uh, the wartens duct with stone there will be enlargement of the submandibular gland now how, how do you proceed with the treatment uh, protocol now um, as i told the wartens duct will be crossed by the lingual nerve stones which are proximal to the lingual nerve which are towards the submandibular gland then we go ahead with excision of the submandibular gland stones which are distal to the lingual nerve that is away from the submandibular gland distal to the lingual nerve then it will be intraoral so you can lay open the submandibular lay open the wartens duct distal to the um, uh, lingual nerve so that you can retrieve the stone but nowadays there are uh, minimal invasive procedures like basketing stone baskettings and all which uh, you can use to retrieve the stone but these are for bigger stones these procedures are for bigger stones now uh, coming uh, that's 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 about the submandibular gland now coming to the sublingual gland as i told before uh, it is situated on the floor of the mouth there will be the most uh, common pathology will be the cyst formation you all know about the ranula uh, now ranula uh, is a mucus extravasation cyst which will be seen on the floor of the mouth and if it is piercing the muscle and if it is comes uh, to the neck portion then it is called a plunging ranula where there will be cross fluctuation which will be present and um, also uh, it will be brilliantly transluminant so that is it about the um, sublingual salivary gland so i have talked regarding the uh, parotid regarding the submandibular and regarding the sublingual and a short uh, um, examination uh, uh, the difference uh, what, what all different things which you should be doing in examination and one more thing which i have missed in parotid gland is the curtain sign what is the curtain sign this parotid gland is in, uh, is uh, having a, a capsule uh, so this particular uh, fascia the deep fascia which will be encasing the parotid gland uh, will be encasing it and will be finishing in the zygomat will be attaching to the zygomatic arch so if there is a parotid gland swelling you won't be able to push the swelling above the zygomatic arch because the fascia is already ending at the zygomatic arch 
the fascia which is enclosing the parotid is ending at the zygomatic arch so you will not be able to push it beyond but you will be able to move it uh, horizontally not vertically like a curtain you can move it horizontally not vertically up and down so that is called the curtain sign which will be specific for uh, parotid gland so uh, don't forget uh, to uh, if you are getting a parotid swelling don't forget to comment regarding the facial nerve regarding the examination of the facial nerve and regarding the oral cavity examination uh, so that's it all the best guys for the exam